Now we change gears. Instead of looking at equations and how to solve them, we're going to look at inequalities. Now remember, very beginning of this course, I said that um, an equation is a mathematical sentence where equals is the verb. Now we're going to look at inequalities. And inequalities are also mathematical sentences. And the verb here is one of the four inequalities. Greater than, greater than or equal to, less than or less than or equal to. So the first thing we'll look at here to get ourselves started is properties of inequalities. Now what are properties of inequalities? Well, first of all, let me translate the word properties. Another way what we might have put it now, now that we know a little more mathematics, we might just say this is basic theorems. And that's what these properties are. They are fundamental theorems that allow you to manipulate inequalities the way we do equations. What will we examine here specifically? Well, let me give you a format picture, okay? This is a picture with boxes. We will be looking at the following types of inequalities. When you have a box less than a box, or when you have a box less than or equal to a box. Now, of course, that second one translates into box less than a box or box equal box. And we will also look at the case where something is greater than something else or something is greater than or equal to something else and that of course also translates into something is greater than the other something or they're equal. So there you have in sort of broad schematic form the kinds of inequalities we're going to be looking at. In this segment I'm going to talk about as I said properties give you the basic theorems that allow us to manipulate these the same way that we do with equations. Things are a little different because we have these four instead of one symbols between the two expressions. Okay, the first one. This one's called the trichotomy property. Fancy name, but you'll see in a moment that it's an idea that is almost obvious from what you know about the real numbers. Trichotomy property. And I'll write each of these as a theorem, because that's what they are. If A and B are real numbers, so you pick any two real numbers, then there are only three things that can happen in their relationships to one another. Either A is less than B, A is equal to B, or A is greater than B. I mean, that's it, folks. With, three, with real numbers, that's all that can happen. Now, I might point out here, just for the record, that this is not true in the complex numbers. Now we won't have time to explore that, but that's not true in the complex numbers. In fact, there is no order in the complex numbers, which is a curious fact. All right, let me visualize this a bit for you, because I want to make sure you're clear on what we're talking about. A less than B means that A is to the left of B on the number line. A equals B means that they are at the same point on the number line. And A greater than B, whoops, almost wrote that incorrectly, I'll put it on the bottom, is when A is greater than B. So A is to the right on the number line. You have to be very careful with inequalities. You can't be uh, as unthinking as you might be with equations because with equations you can move things back and forth. This you have to be very careful about the direction of the inequality. Now one case is worth noting, when B is zero, we have these three possibilities up here. A is less than B, A is equal to B, or A is greater than B. If B is zero, what does that say? That say, it says that A is, is less than zero, A is equal to zero, or A is greater than zero. In other words, every real number is either negative, zero, or positive. Again, this is something that seems completely obvious to you. But it is a fundamental fact about inequalities that we're going to be using quite a bit coming up. So this is trichotomy. Simply says that one of three relationships between any two numbers, real numbers, must always hold. Okay, property number two. I'll give these all names. Let's call this the non-negative property. Again, it's a theorem. This is the non-negative property. It's one that you also should know from your experience. If A is any real number whatsoever, 
then when you square this number you get a number which is greater than or equal to zero now everybody knows from your experience that if you square a number you either get a positive number or if the number is zero to begin with you get zero so this is just a statement of something that's familiar I might point out something that you can observe to show you why this is true observe the following if you graph the very familiar curve y equals x squared and if you come over a distance a left or right then of course the height here in both cases is a squared and so if a is a real number anywhere then all this says is that the parabola's graph is above the x-axis a squared is always up here it's always greater than or equal to zero this would be the y equals zero line okay so there's a nice little picture Of course the square of a number is always positive or zero is something that should be second nature by now alright further there is the transitive property another one that will seem very familiar once I get it written out here the transitive property it says the following it'll be in two parts very often we'll have uh, statements about inequalities in two parts because we have to consider the less than cases and the greater than cases and they'll usually mimic each other if a is less than b and b is less than c notice that b is common here then we conclude that a is less than c so the a is less than the c and that makes sense because they share this b in the middle and if I draw a little picture here if I have a is less than b is less than c going like that then it's clear that a is less than c in the picture there's no mystery if I then write this out for the other case I said there's usually two cases this is the greater than case if a is greater than b and b in turn is greater than c notice the b is common in the middle again then the obvious conclusion is that a is greater than c there's a there's c and again the picture certainly confirms it if a is greater than b is greater than c we have a here going downwards b here and c here a is greater than b is greater than c so a is certainly greater than c so the transitive property says if you link up inequalities in the same direction then you can jump from the first to the last and preserve the inequality it's a very simple idea okay now let's look at one one might call the addition property but I have another name for it here the addition property you might call this simply a horizontal shift now that's something we've studied horizontal shift and here's what's going on let's just say for any real number C the following holes and go ahead and run a line here to try and keep this organized first time it will be for less than and of course the second one will be for greater than if a is less than B then take that real number that arbitrary real number add it to both sides a plus C and you preserve the direction is less than B plus C you see we've added C to both sides and the direction has been preserved now why would that be true well if you think about the picture for just a short amount of time you'll see that no matter what C is this is going to be a horizontal shift let me see if I can give you a nice careful drawing here suppose this is a and this is B and clearly a is less than B there I'll extend my little B up there if we have the case that C is a positive number when you add it to both sides it's going to shift both numbers to the right that is to say upward so what we will then have is 
A plus C shifted up, and then B plus C shifted up the same amount, so the inequality still holds. All you've done is taken the original and moved them off to the right. If C is less than zero, then the opposite movement happens. If you have C less than zero, then the arrow goes the other way, and the A plus C, B plus C preserves the relationship, but is now shifted off to the left. So adding a number C to either side shifts it either right or left, depending on what C is. If then we have the case where A is greater than B, then the result is similar. A plus C is greater than B plus C. Again, the same C has been added to both sides, and this is a similar picture. Okay, I won't go through it. The only difference is that you start out with A greater than B instead of B greater than A. And uh, you will have a shift left or right depending on whether C is positive or negative. So that's the addition property. If you add the same number to both sides of an inequality, the direction of the inequality does not change. And that's what you want to remember from that. Now there is another property or set of properties I want to talk about. We talked about addition. You might expect there's some sort of property associated with multiplication. First, I want to motivate it. I think by seeing a couple of examples, you'll, be, you'll see why the final theorem actually works. Motivation. Now here's what I want to do in these problems. I want to multiply each side. I'm going to give you some problems here. As indicated. And once you've done that, write the correct resulting inequality. Okay, so we will analyze this for two examples and that will suggest the next property. Okay, here's the first one. Three is less than seven. That's given to you and it's also clear. Want to multiply that by two and let me mar remark here that 2 is a positive number. It is greater than 0. Well, the solution is, let's do the multiplication on either side. And I'll write it out even. Since 3 times 2 is equal to 6, that's the left-hand side. And 7 times 2 is equal to 14, that's the right-hand side. Then 6 is less than 14 left and right, and the direction has been preserved. So this is the same direction. So I have multiplied by 2, which is a positive number, and I did not change the direction of the inequality. Let us now try another one. Suppose 9 is greater than 2. That's certainly true. Let us now multiply that by minus 4. Now minus 4 is a number that is less than 0. It is a negative number. Solution here, similarly, I won't write it out this time, minus 4 times 9, of course, is minus 36. Minus 4 times 2 is minus 8. But we cannot keep the inequality the same direction, can we? We can't say that minus 36 is bigger than minus 8 because it's not true. Minus 36 is further down in the negative direction. So what we've got going on here is a reversal. So this is reverses direction. And those are the two observations I wanted to make here. It seems that, based on these two simple examples, if we multiply by a positive number, the direction of the inequality does not change. If we multiply by a negative number, it does. And that's exactly what the multiplication properties say. Now let's write them out formally here. Multiplication properties. Once we're done with all of this, you'll have a chance to try these out and confirm to yourself that they're all sensible. Multiplication properties, the first one is if A is less than B and C is greater than zero, so we're talking positive number here, 
Then what happens if you multiply both sides by C? Well, as we saw before, nothing happens. A times C is less than B times C. The direction, no change in direction. So that is the benign case, if you like, multiplying by a positive number. The case that you have to be very careful about is this one. If A is less than B and C is less than zero, say negative, then this is the case where the inequality reverses. A times C is now greater than B times C, so it has reversed direction. And that is the sneaky case. Okay? Because very often when you multiply two sides of an expression by some other expression, you're not, you may not be certain whether that expression is positive or negative. And if it's an inequality, that can affect the result. So you have to take this into account and be very careful. All right, there are two other cases here. I'm not going to write them out because I think you know what they are. All they are is they take the, instead of less than, they take the greater than cases. So likewise for the A greater than B cases. Okay? So to put it in short, multiplication by the dreaded negative number by C less than zero changes the direction of the inequality sign. It always changes the direction. Now that's the only thing you want to keep in mind. So I realize that this is something that we need to practice, so let's go ahead and look at a couple of examples just to make sure that we're happy with this. Example, and in these we'll solve for x as always. 2x less than 6, solve for x. Well, the actual operation you want to do is either divide by 2, both sides, or if you like, multiply by 1 half, which is the way I want to think about it. Multiply by 1 half. No change, because 1 half is greater than 0. So multiplying by 1 half doesn't change anything. I'm left with x is less than 3. And that, of course, is the benign case, as I mentioned before. Now comes the sneaky case. Solve for x. x over minus 3 is greater than 12. Now what you want to do is multiply by minus 3. Minus 3 times x over minus 3, and then minus 3 times 12 on the right. So minus 3 times both sides. But remember, minus 3 is less than 0, which means that the direction of the inequality has to change. So you end up with x is less than minus 36 in this case. So those were fairly straightforward. As we start doing inequalities with uh, variables involved, or more variables and more difficult solutions, we'll have to be very, very careful about multiplication. If you multiply by a negative, the direction of the inequality must change. If you multiply by a variable and you're not sure whether it's positive or negative, you need to take two cases. Okay. Well, let's wrap up our properties with one more. We'll call this the reciprocal or the flip-over property. How about that? The flip-over property. Now, this is one you could have deduced on your own but having it nearby is always handy. If A is positive, then 1 over A is also positive. And likewise, if it works for positive, it works for negative. If A is negative, then 1 over A is negative 2. And when you think about it, that makes reasonably good sense. Let me draw you a little picture down here, kind of put it schematically. This will be the zero line where zero is. And suppose this is the number one, this is the number minus one. And let's imagine that A is out here somewhere. There's A. If you flip A over, where does it go? It goes over here somewhere and becomes one over A. If you take an A that's beyond minus one and you flip it over, 
it becomes a number in here which is also 1 over a. If you're on the positive side, you stay on the positive side when you flip over. If you're on the negative, you stay on the negative. There's no crossover. Okay. Now those are all the basic properties of inequalities that we're going to be using extensively. And when we come back, we'll start actually solving inequalities. Now that we have properties of inequalities under our belts, we can go ahead and start worrying about how you solve inequalities. First, I'll talk about solving inequalities in general, get some basic principles down, and then we'll start solving specific types of inequalities, linear inequalities and the like. So let's go ahead and start with this, solving inequalities in general. And, of course, solving inequalities, we are not starting from scratch. We have all the technique that we've learned from equation solving. And all of that will apply here. So as with equations, basically we do the same thing. What do we want to do? We want to find all the x values that make the inequality true. Okay, this is a very simple idea, but let's just review it here. So you find all the x values, however that's done. And in the process, what do we do? We use algebra, including those properties we saw in the last segment. We use algebra to alter the inequality that we start with, whatever inequality that is. We use it to alter the inequality, uh, getting equivalent but easier equivalent but easier ones or easier inequalities and we keep doing that until the inequality is so easy we can read the answer off immediately easier inequalities until the solution is clear so that's very, very broad, and that's like equations. However, unlike equations, let me put that down here. Unlike equations, direction matters. Direction, direction of what? The less than, the less than or equal to, the greater than, or the greater than or equal to matters. See, with equations, we have as our verb in the mathematical sentence equals and it doesn't matter which way you read equals but with inequalities the direction makes a big difference and so that will affect everything we do so if you're thinking about solving inequalities the first natural question you ask is what can I do to an inequality that will not change the direction and then what well, can I do to an inequality that will change the direction? I want to be very clear on the two of them so I know when the direction is going to be left alone or changed. So let me just indicate those. One, one question. What leaves direction, and of course I mean direction of the inequality symbol, unchanged? Okay, that's a natural question. Well, based on the properties we saw in the last segment, we know the answer. What leaves direction unchanged? Well, if you simplify both sides separately, you really are not having anything to do with the inequality. You're staying on either, the, either of the sides. Now, what would that entail? Well, there are a variety of things you can do. One of them, of course, is you can combine like terms. We've done that before. You're staying on each side now. You're not moving side to side. Like terms, uh, eliminate uh, parentheses, right, etc. All the things that you do that keeps you on the two sides without moving across the inequality sign is not going to change the direction of the inequality. What else can you do that won't change it? Well, as we learned, you can add the same number to each side. Adding a number to each side, remember, is a horizontal shift. Doesn't change the, uh, uh, the direction of the inequality, simply shifts it up or down. And finally, under multiply, you can multiply each side by the same, and of course you know what I'm going to say next, positive number. Positive number. As long as you're multiplying by a positive number, you will not change the direction of your inequality. 
Well, the second question is, if this is what leaves the direction unchanged, what causes the direction to change? Well, it's very important to make sure we're clear on that. So two, what reverses? Reverses the direction. That's a major question that we want to have answered. Well, one very simple one is, if you have two less than three, and you write it in the other order, that makes three greater than two. So that changes the inequality simply by interchanging or interchange the two sides. So here you're not really doing anything except moving. A less than B is the same thing, of course, as B greater than A. And by changing the sides of the letters, I have to alter the inequality sign, of course. Then, what else can you do that will change the direction? Well, the sneaky case we talked about before, if you multiply each side by the same negative number, negative number, then you will change the direction of the inequality. And this is the one that causes the most difficulty because we have to keep reminding ourselves of it. Well, let's continue on in our analysis of how you solve inequalities in general. Just as I wrote with equations, I'll write down this fact for inequalities. All inequalities in one variable, and of course we're only working with one variable, and I'll tend to use x here, but it could be any variable. One variable, say x, can be written as one of the following. Well, how could we write all equations? If you recall, all equations could be written as some f of x equals zero. In other words, you could push everything over to the left and have only zero on the right. You can do the same thing for inequalities. That makes sense. f of x less than zero, f of x less than or equal to zero, f of x greater than zero, or f of x greater than or equal to zero. So that's all the non-zero terms on the left and zero left on the right. So this is just like equations where we had f of x equals zero. So remember we're going to be using a lot of the information we got from doing equations to solve inequalities. Well, speaking of solving, let's move from here and see how we would solve such things. So solving these various inequalities, f of x less than zero, f of x less than or equal to zero, f of x greater than zero, and f of x greater than or equal to zero. Okay, how does one solve these? Well, algebraically, we do the same thing we've done before. We solve, find all the x values that make the expressions true. Graphically is where things become interesting. I'll mention the algebra case just to be complete, and it, it repeats a little bit of what I said before, but that's okay. As with equations f of x equals zero, we want to find all x values, and these are numbers, remember, x values are numbers, which make these inequalities true. Okay, so that is the standard algebraic method, and we do that by simplifying our inequalities using algebraic techniques. But graphically, remember that f of x stands for y when you're looking at the graph, y being the vertical dimension. And by saying less than zero, we're saying go down. Greater than zero, go up. These are the notions that we want to explore graphically. Because here's where you can get some real insight into what inequalities tell you. For example, I'll just start with this one. For f of x less than zero, that particular inequality case. When you are solving that, what does it mean graphically? 
It means to find the x intervals where the graph, and it's the graph of y equals f of x, of course, is below. Less than zero means below, downward, in the y direction. It's below the x-axis, which, of course, is the y equals zero line, as you recall. So we're talking about this kind of a picture. If this is your y equals zero line, also known as the x-axis, of course, and this is your function curve, then this is the part that's below, right? And there'll be an interval here, and that will be the x interval we are searching for if we're trying to solve f of x less than zero, below, where f of x is below. In fact, I've drawn up a picture here that I'll show you again later. We'll do this a couple of times. But I want you to keep in mind what we're talking about. y equals zero is the x-axis. y greater than zero means above the x-axis. y less than zero means below it. So keep in mind that an inequality that says f of x is greater than zero is above, f of x is less than zero is below. OK, we'll set this picture aside so we can use it again later. Now this was for x less than zero. Of course, the same argument holds for greater than zero. Likewise, and I'll try and mimic the other page here, for f of x greater than zero, what we want to do is find x intervals, just as we did on the other one. But this time where the graph of y equals f of x, the function curve, is above rather than below, above because it's greater than zero now, above the x-axis, which of course is the y equals zero line. And the little picture, you can probably expect what it's going to look like here. Here's the y equals zero line, or the x-axis. And here we have our function curve passing through there, crossing the axis, and here's the part of the curve that's above the axis. Now there is an interval associated with that. This and any other cases where this occurs, these are the kind of x intervals we are interested in when we're solving f of x greater than zero. Intervals where the curve goes above. So visually it's very easy to see what's going on. In fact, to make it even more visual for you, I have a more dramatic picture. Let's explore this little picture in detail here. Okay? y equals f of x is the function that is the boundary. And the graph of y equals f of x is this curve that snakes through here. And I've marked off the various places. f of x is greater than zero up here. That's above the axis. It's also greater than zero in this region. That's above. It's less than zero down here and it's less than zero down here. And of course where it crosses here, here, and here are where it is equal to zero. So it's equal to zero at the x-intercepts. Those are the equations f of x equals zero which we solved before. Greater and less than zero corresponding to these pictures. And this of course is the y equals zero line, the x-axis. So ponder that for a moment and try to keep in mind when we're doing inequalities that these are the kind of pictures that will help you visualize graphically the solutions that you're getting algebraically. Okay, well, now that we've addressed that, let me finally, just to wrap this up, finally, for the two cases that have been left out now, f of x less than or equal to zero and f of x greater than or equal to zero, well, we already know how to solve the less than or greater than part, and the equal zero part, as you know, is the equation. So for these, the recommendation is first solve f of x less than zero and f of x greater than zero, respectively. Then include points, include x values, which remember again are numbers, keep this in mind are numbers where f of x equals zero.
Now that's an equation. Okay, and we know how to solve that. And one more observation. Let me bring back the last picture I had up here a moment ago. This one. This observation is crucial to making your work easier later. Observe. Moving from greater than zero to less than zero, you pass through zero. Moving from less than zero to greater than zero, you pass through zero. Notice that to move from above to below, you have to pass through the zero point. Which means if you know where all the zero points are, you know that in between zero points, you're either totally above or totally below. Totally above or totally below. So finding the zero points will be the first thing we do. Once we have those as boundary points, as points, we'll use the word split points, because notice they split the plane into strips. Those points, once we have them, will allow us to find out the greater or less than points. So that's really quite nice as an observation. Uh, the endpoints of these x intervals, just to write out a little bit of what I just said, are the uh, solutions of the equation f of x equals zero. And using them will allow us to get our work done with inequalities quite quickly. So, now that we've got all the preparations ready, it's time to start solving actual inequalities. That'll be what we do next. All right, we've looked at properties of inequalities and how to solve inequalities in general. Now we're going to actually start doing them by looking first at solving linear inequalities. And then later on we'll look at quadratic inequalities. So let's go ahead and get started with this. Solving linear inequalities. Definition. Let's define what a linear inequality is first. A linear inequality, inequality here, in one variable, because that's the only sort that we look at, has one of these standard forms. We always like to start off with standard forms, because that'll make our work easier as we go. One of these standard forms, it will be of the form ax plus b is less than zero, ax plus b is less than or equal to zero, ax plus b is greater than zero, and ax plus b is greater than or equal to zero. Now there are four different versions there because we have four different inequality symbols as opposed to one equality symbol with linear equations. And throughout this, of course, this is where a is not zero because if a is zero, of course, we don't have a linear expression. And that the two coefficients a and b are real numbers. We don't deal with complex numbers here. So, let's go ahead and get right into this and look at an actual example. Here's an example. Nice, simple, linear inequality. As usual, we will want to solve for x. And it will be, in this case, 3 minus 2x less than 5. As opposed to equations where we had equality there, we now have an inequality. Well, the solution that we'll look at, of course, we'll look at the algebraic version first. Let me first rewrite what I have there, 3 minus 2x less than 5. Now, using the properties of inequalities I know, I can very simply reorganize this. The first thing I'm going to do is take the 3, of course, and move it to the other side by subtracting. So that'll leave me with minus 2x less than 5 minus 3, of course, is 2. And then what I want to do here is either divide by minus 2, or it's better to think about it as, as multiplication by minus 1 half. And since minus 1 half is less than 0, I remember that when I multiply by that, I will have to reverse the inequality. So I can multiply minus 2x by minus 1 half, but the inequality in the center must be reversed. And then on the other side, I multiply minus 1 half by 2. As long as I reverse the inequality, things will be fine. On the left, I have x, of course, and on the right, I have just minus 1. And that is the solution. We've now described all the x values involved here. We can also write this, as you know, as an interval. If x is greater than minus 1, it is in the interval from minus 1 open to infinity. So there's an alternate way of writing this. Also, there's the picture. Doesn't hurt to keep pictures in mind. If this is the real number line and that's minus 1, 
and this is open hold here because minus one's not included, we want all the numbers bigger than minus one. Of course, that means all the numbers over here to the left, or to the right, rather. So, with those three uh, visualizations of the solution, we have solved this algebraically. If we want to look at this graphically, we can. And this is what it'll turn out to be, graphical look at this. Remember we were looking at 3 minus 2x less than 5 originally. I will now bring the 5 over to the left because we want to get it in that f of x less than 0 form, or in this case that ax plus b less than 0 form. So subtracting 5 from both sides leaves us with a minus 2 here, minus 2x less than 0. We'll label the left-hand side f of x as we've done so many times before. And what does the less than 0 mean in the picture? What it means is below the x-axis, as we've seen in pictures also before. So if we look at a picture now, and here's the window I chose, minus 5 to 5 by minus 5 to 5, fairly standard kind of window. Here is the picture I got on my calculator, which you can generate on your own. There are my two axes. And here is the line coming down here, something like this, crossing here at minus 1. And then the part here from minus 1 over to the right is the part of the graph that is below the x-axis, which is the part we were interested in. And this looks just like the picture on the previous page where we started with minus 1 and went to the right forever. So there's a visualization of this graphically. And it's a nice, simple inequality for us to look at. Let's look at one that's a bit more complicated, but still leads to something that's linear. Here's another one. Solve for x. The inequality this time is x times 9x minus 5 less than or equal to the quantity 3x minus 1 squared. Now on the surface, at first glance, this looks like a much more than linear inequality because on this side we have things that are squared which suggest that it's quadratic. However, as you'll see, just like with nonlinear equations that reduce to linear equations, it's possible that this will reduce and we'll see what happens. On the left, I'll multiply things out. So I will end up with 9x squared minus 5x, less than or equal to. On the right, I'll multiply out this binomial. We've done that before. So I'll have 9x squared first minus 6x plus 1. And now I see what happens. There's my 9x squared there and a 9x squared there. Since they're the same on both sides, I can simply subtract them away. And now all of a sudden I have a linear inequality. It's no longer quadratic. So what do I have? I have minus 5x less than or equal to minus 6x plus 1. And now I can go on to simplify this as I did in the previous problem. Let me take this minus, 5, uh, minus 6x over to the left. That'll become plus 6x. Then minus 5x will be x less than or equal to 1. And lo and behold, I am done again. So there it is written as an inequality. As an interval, it would be in the interval from minus infinity to 1, including 1. That's the square brackets there. And then if I wanted a picture again to make sure this is 1, I want to include 1, and I want to go this time, I'm going less than or equal to, so I'm going to the left. So there we are. Very simple to solve this with a little bit of effort. Uh, the graph, if you want to look at that, I will leave that to you. But now I'll pose you a problem that you can do on your own time. Here is something for you to look at. Solve for x. Now this is an inequality that has two inequality symbols. So it's in three pieces. We have the inequality minus 1 less than or equal to 3 minus 5x over 2. And simultaneously, at the same time, must hold the fact that 3 minus 5x over 2 is less than or equal to 9. My hint here is to try to solve all of this together. So go ahead and give that a try, and I'll be back in a moment.
All right, I've rewritten the problem here just to remind us of what it is. 3x minus 5x over 2 is caught between minus 1 and 9. And my hint was to try it all at once. Well, the first thing I see that I really want to do is I want to get rid of this 2. So I want to multiply through by 2. Now, multiplying by 2, 2 is greater than 0 will not change the direction of the inequality sign, but it will simplify things nicely. So I have minus 2 less than or equal to 3 minus 5x less than or equal to 18. 9 times 2 is 18. Now, I'll take the 3 here and subtract it throughout. On the left, I'll have minus 5 less than or equal to minus 5x less than or equal to 15. I'm subtracting 3. And now you see what I'd like to do is divide by minus 5. I'm going to interpret that as multiplying by minus 1 fifth. And I'll just note that minus 1 fifth is less than 0. So when I multiply through, I need to change the direction of all my inequalities. So I will have 1 now here, greater than or equal to, that is now change direction, x in the middle, greater than or equal to, that is also change direction, and minus 3. Now, for convenience, and by convention, we don't like to have our inequalities written this way. We prefer to have the smaller number at the left and the larger number at the right. So if I just reverse the directions, and I will have x still in the middle, but now the right-hand side becomes the left, so x is greater than or equal to minus 3, x less than or equal to minus 1, or plus 1, rather, on the right. So this becomes the inequality that solves the original problem gives me a boundary on x, a lower and an upper bound. If I want to write this as an interval, I see that x is in the interval from minus 3, square brackets including minus 3, less than or equal to 1, so it's 1 including 1 in square brackets. And if you want to go ahead and graph this, this is even easier than some of the others. There's minus 3 and 1. I am including both ends, and then I'm simply shading in everything that occurs in between. Now, there is a warning I want to give you here because there is something that could have been done here at this stage that would have been incorrect. So let me give you a warning so you won't do that. Warning. Do not translate 1 greater than or equal to x, greater than or equal to minus 3. Now, that was that expression, which is correct as it stands. But do not translate this blindly into, and here's what some people will do in error. They'll write the 1 down from the left, and they'll say x is then in the interval from 1, 2, and they'll put the minus 3 at the other end, and they'll stop like that. Well, think about that. That doesn't make any sense. This is an interval that starts at 1 and ends at minus 3. This is meaningless. And it only, occurs that if, it, it only occurs if you're not thinking. See, the correct interval here, as we saw on the previous page, is minus 3 to 1, with the lower one on the left and the upper one on the right. So this is incorrect, and that was done from just copying down the numbers here, but without realizing what these inequality signs mean. So, try not to do that yourself. Be careful so that when you're setting up intervals like this, that the left-hand side is always less than the right-hand side. Okay. Now, before I do another example, let me give you a little bit of a fact. This is a small theorem, as you know. And the theorem is this. It'll be something that'll be helpful to us later. If you have this situation where A is greater than 0 and B is greater than A, so that means B and A are both greater than zero, meaning they're both positive. Then, one can conclude the following, that A squared is less than B squared. In other words, if you have two positive numbers in an inequality relationship like this, then you can simply square both sides and the inequality is preserved. Now this one's simple enough for me to do, then I'll go ahead and show you the proof. It's a nice little example of mathematical reasoning, so we might as well do it. Okay, first observation, both A and B are positive. That was given in the if part up here. Since they're both positive, so if you add them together, you have a positive number. So A plus B is greater than zero. No question there. Also, 
since not only are they both positive, but we know that A is less than B, that was also given in the if part. Since A is less than B, if I subtract B from both sides here, I have A minus B is less than zero. That's the second observation. So A plus B is greater than zero or positive. A minus B is less than zero or, if you want me to write the word in there, negative. So, with those two pieces of information, if we multiply those two numbers, A minus B times A plus B, I have multiplied A negative by a positive, which means that the result is negative. But wait, A minus B times A plus B is simply the difference of two squares. A squared minus B squared is less than zero. And if I move the B squared over to the right, what do I have? I have A squared less than B squared, and that is as desired, meaning that's what I was trying to prove. See? A squared less than B squared, and I suddenly have it. So with a little bit of reasoning here, we can end up with the result. So that's a nice result, and we're going to use it in an upcoming problem. So remember, if two numbers are positive, and they have an inequality A less than B, then their squares preserve that inequality. Okay, here's a little example in which this fact will turn up. The problem as stated is this. Find A and B such that if you know that 0 is less than 2x is less than 6, then x squared will be caught between the A you're looking for and the B you're looking for. So if I know this about x, that 2x is caught between 0 and 6, I want to find A and B so that it will form a boundary for x squared. Well, how do I go about doing this? Let's see here. Well, the idea is simple. I will simply write down the form x squared with a box at each end and hope that somehow I can go from the first inequality to this one by some series of algebraic operations. So let me begin with the first inequality. One thing I can do immediately is I can isolate the x. That's easy. I can simply multiply through by one half. One half, of course, is greater than zero, so I do not change the direction of the inequalities. Multiplying by one half gives me zero, less than x, and then less than three. Now, the idea that I would like to use is I would simply like to go ahead and square everything. Well, I can for this part over here by the fact, it was on the previous page, by the fact we have here, since x is less than 3 and, x, and they're both greater than 0, we can immediately write down that x squared is less than 3 squared. That's immediately from the fact. What about the first part here? Can we write that x squared is greater than 0? Well, sure we can. If x is greater than 0, that means x is positive. If you square it, it remains positive. So the fact gives us the second inequality, and our knowledge of 0 gives us the first. So we have x squared caught between 0 and 3 squared. Well, wait a minute. That's exactly what we were trying to do, wasn't it? We wanted to catch x squared between an a and a b, which means that a is 0, and b is 3 squared, or 9. So there we are. Nice simple problem in which we use that fact about positive numbers, preserving the inequality under the squaring operation, as we did here. Okay, let's stop there, and when we come back, we'll look at to, uh, quadratic inequalities.